I grew up with the BBC Micro, which used the 6502 CPU and have very fond memories of writing both basic programs and 6502 assembler. So when I discovered a Benita's 6502 computer built on breadboards, thanks to the infallible YouTube algorithm, I watched from afar thinking, oh, that's cute. Recently though, I found Adrian Kohlbecker's video series, which he's still working on, and that was that. I had to have a go myself. I'm not going to document my build of his system, as there's only so much breadboard wiring that a person should be made to watch. Instead, I want to describe a parallel project along with my design steps. That particular project, Video Output. Benita has already designed what he called the worst graphics card ever. It's a nice introduction to the problem, so please go watch that. It's possible to build an 8-bit micro that has the same feature set as the favourites, such as the BC Micro, ZX Spectrum, 6024, and so on, up to a point. The 6502 and its derivative, the 65C816, are still made today, as is the Z80. You can still buy EEPROMs, and they are as slow today as they were back in the day. You can still get SRAM in 32K chips. The main issue is the custom chips they use for video output. The micro manufacturers might have used some common chips such as the Motorola 6845, but these were just part of the circuit which inevitably used some custom logic. There were degrees of that, such as the Ferranti ULA for Acorn or the VIC-2 for the C64, but still getting something like that new these days is impossible. For some, the answer is FPGA. I fully respect that decision, but for me, that goes against the spirit of the retro build. It's possible to glue things together with 74 series chips, just about, but it'll become unwieldy. No offence to Ben's design. Therefore, I settled on programmable logic chips. Atomel still make chips which are compatible with the discontinued GAL series from Lattice. I won't go into any detail here, as there are better descriptions online, and I'll cover the details in a later video, assuming I remember to. This, I think, is a good compromise. I'm clearly using tools and techniques not available to the designers in the 80s, though the implementation is not worlds away. Enough of that. 80s micros generally outputted either some form of composite signal or TV modulated signal. These days, apart from perhaps the unloved analog aerial input to your TV, this is now gone. So today we have four options, VGA, DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort. DisplayPort can be dismissed very easily. It is a packet-driven protocol that runs in the gigahertz range. DVI is in theory plausible as it is quite similar to the VGA in that it has three separate channels and pixels are pumped synchronously. However, it's still more complicated. HDMI started as DVI plus other things, requires licenses to implement, so let's ignore that. It's VGA then. Fortunately, it's still supported as a fallback on monitors and TVs. And crucially, the base resolution of 640x480 is achievable, sort of, using breadboard logic. I'll spare you the description of how VGA transmits the data and how a CRT works. Instead, let's look at the visual representation of a frame. The output is blank for 10 lines, two lines of vertical sync where the VSync pin is pulled low, 33 further blank lines, and finally, 480 lines of content. This gives a total of 525 lines. For each horizontal line, likewise, there are blank 16 pixels, 96 for horizontal sync, where the H sync pin is pulled low, 48 for the blank pixels, and the 640 pixels of content. This gives a total of 800 pixels in the line at a pixel frequency of 25.175 megahertz. 800 pixels per line gives a horizontal frequency of about 31.5 kilohertz and a screen refresh rate of 59.94 hertz, which everyone calls 60 hertz because reasons. Running at a clock of just over 25 megahertz is a bit ambitious for a circuit that spans over multiple breadboards, so I'm going to be halving the frequency using a flip flop to 12.5 megahertz. That gives a horizontal resolution of 320 pixels which was pretty common in the 80s and even early 90s for games. Because VGA uses analog signals, 
keeping the same RGB values for two 25 MHz clock cycles just gives two pixels of the same color. As you can see from this table, running at half the clock rate gives a total of 400 pixels, of which 320 are visible. The timings for the various portions will be useful later. The vertical resolution could do with reducing two, mainly for memory usage reasons. However, this can only really be achieved by either skipping lines, leaving a stripey effect on the screen, or doubling lines, I'm aiming for the doubling approach. The final problem is that 320 by 240 at 4 bits per pixel would require 37.5k of RAM. I want 4 bits per pixel as a good compromise between number of colours and memory used. This amount of RAM though is peculiar and larger than the standard 32k RAM chips. Therefore, a final adjustment is to make the visible area only 200 rows high. By increasing the front and back porch by 40 rows each, the overall timings remain the same, just with black borders around the visible area. On to the design. At the heart of it, we need three distinct counters. One for the pixels across the horizontal line, one for the lines down the vertical, and one for memory addresses. I suppose, in theory, the horizontal and vertical counters could be combined with a multiply and add to form an address, but that's just too much logic. The horizontal counter needs to count from 0 to 399 inclusive, that requires 9 bits. The vertical counter needs to count from 0 to 524, this requires 10 bits. The address, well, I'll deal with that later. I also need to have the two sync outputs, HS and VS, and some other control for the memory access. I'll explain the actual design better in another video, including how I program and use the 22V10s. But here's the circuit so far on a breadboard. We've got a 20 LED bar over here. The rightmost bits here are the horizontal counter, nine of them. And on the left, we've got the vertical counter, 10 bits. And there's some loose LEDs for flags. The, the one that's probably most interesting there is the left yellow one, and that's the vertical sink. So remember that it is pulled low when the sink is active. So connected to the clock module from Adrian's design. Thank you, Adrian. And I'm just going to start running with the slow clock, and you'll be able to see the horizontal counter counting up. And then if I speed it up a little bit, you'll see that it counts up to 399. And then you'll see the vertical counter begin to count as well. And you'll see that the vertical sync went low there for two rows, which is good. So let's switch to the fast clock. See, it's going very quickly now. This LED indicates when we're in the visible area in terms of rows. And so that's flashing at about a frequency of 0.6 hertz, which I think the fast clock at the moment is running at 250 kilohertz. So that's 100 times slower than our target. So that's about right. So far, so good. In the next video, I'll show how I programmed the logic, explain some of the advantages and limitation of these 22V10 chips that I have here, and maybe talk about why a synchronous design like I have here is needed. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you very much for watching.